This fall, in Chicago, we will lead massive demonstrations against the war in support of the Black Panther Party and in solidarity with all political prisoners. Today, he is a professor of education at the University of Illinois at Chicago. But in 1969, Bill Ayers and the other leaders of a group called the Weathermen felt frustrated by the slow pace of efforts to end the Vietnam War. Every day that the war went on, 2,000 innocent people would be killed. Not 2,000 a year, not 200 a day, 2,000 a day were going to be killed. And that meant that if we couldn't stop it tomorrow, it would be 2,000. If we couldn't stop it by Friday, it would be 10,000, and so on. And so there was a kind of a, an urgency that took over. And in that context, we faced each other and tried to figure out what do you do to end a war? How do you stop it? The answer they decided was to bring to American streets a taste of the violence which they saw the U.S. delivering in Vietnam. The central slogan of this action, besides the demands, the specifics, is bring the war home. We're building a revolutionary movement that will fight the internal army, which is the police force. Yes, more physical contact if that's necessary. Whatever it takes, we'll do by any means possible. The militants, the young people, the students, had been the heart and soul of every demonstration since 1965. But we were always being contained and controlled by, you know, liberals. And we felt that we ought to call a demonstration in which we weren't contained and controlled. What we were hoping for was a huge outpouring of militants, um, of young people. The weathermen predicted that 50,000 people would come to Chicago. Instead, the days of rage began with just a few hundred protesters. When we arrived at Lincoln Park uh, that first night of the demonstration, the feeling of being deflated and defeated in me was palpable. And uh, then the question was, do we go forward? And we did go forward. My count was there were maybe tops 200 people there. I thought it looked somewhat ludicrous uh, to see all these kids wearing uh, their football helmets, uh, shoulder pads. Ayers remembers that some of the protesters carried a hidden arsenal of street weapons, steel pipes, chains, slingshots, baseball bats. Even if there were just a few hundred of us, I don't think I had any doubt in the middle of it that we should do it. Um, we should try to get downtown and try to attack the federal building and so on. That first night, the demonstrators stayed on the near north side. At least two protesters were shot and 65 were arrested. Then the action moved downtown, where for three days, protesters battled police and attacked banks and businesses. People of Chicago last night witnessed an outrage against the community. Those who were arrested and charged for taking part in the attacks and destruction last night and again this morning were between the ages of 18 and 25. And I'd like to emphasize this, they are not kids. I commend the hundreds of police officers who manifested the high dedication to duty and professional conduct. The thought of the Chicago Police Department and the mayor of the city of Chicago was to try to avoid confrontation uh, we were rather gun-shy at this point uh, from the criticism. Today, Richard Elrod is a circuit court judge. In 1969, he was a state legislator and an attorney for the city of Chicago. In 69, the city still faced widespread criticism for its handling of demonstrators at the Democratic Convention a year earlier. 
During the days of rage, Richard Elrod was on the scene, advising the city and police. The philosophy at that point was to try to avoid confrontation. Uh, if they want to protest, uh, let them protest. I don't think the police or the city learned a thing between 68 and 69. In fact, I think that they were furious and they were fully intending uh, to kick our ass. And in a way, we met each other with our own kind of um, metaphors fully unfurled. Uh, our metaphor was that we were dangerous revolutionaries and their metaphor was we were dangerous revolutionaries. And uh, we fought that out right in the streets of Chicago. And if Chicago police weren't already sufficiently fired up, the weathermen fanned the flames just before the days of rage by blowing up a statue honoring Chicago policemen. Now we have an out and out defiant gesture by uh, groups that have come in here to upset the city. And uh, we wonder now what will happen. Uh, now it's a statue. Will it be a policeman performing his duty tomorrow or what? But it wasn't just Mayor Daley and the police who were trying to stop the weathermen. Other anti-war activists were among the most vocal critics of the days of rage. We thought it was off the wall. We thought it was silly, counterproductive, uh, that it wasn't going to go anywhere. Uh, I mean, that's the best we thought of it. In 1969, Carl Davidson was a national leader of the militant anti-war group Students for a Democratic Society. The Weathermen were a faction of SDS and opposed by many in the organization. The Weathermen began to believe out of their experience that the problem that the uh, youth movement faced was that we were somehow not courageous enough. And what they really believed was that um, if they took up arms, if they showed that they were young, white, privileged people ready to put their lives on the line or to, you know, take up arms, that the masses of workers and peasants in the United States would rise up and follow them to the barricades. Um, we didn't believe that that was true. October 11th was the fifth and final day of rage. A few hundred protesters rallied at the base of the destroyed police statue and then headed into the loop. Richard Elrod remembers being at the corner of Clark and Madison when he saw a protester being chased by police. I, mean, I put my walkie-talkie down and I tackled him and uh, he fell to the ground, I fell to the ground, and he was wearing these big construction boots uh, that had the metal toe inside and uh, evidently to extricate himself from my grip, he, was, he kicked me in the neck a few times. Richard Elrod's neck was broken. The protester, 22-year-old New Yorker Brian Flanagan, was arrested by police. At first, no one knew the seriousness of Elrod's injury, and it was worsened when he was put on a stretcher and taken to the hospital. He was paralyzed from the neck down. While a few hundred weathermen fought police downtown, another faction of Students for a Democratic Society organized its own marches through the west side and attracted thousands. The demonstrations were held together with the Black Panthers and Young Lords. They promised nonviolence and they delivered. Rather than wreaking havoc on Michigan Avenue, we decided to make, take our march through a wandering course through Chicago's working class neighborhoods. But they got all the media. Uh, the media was big on uh, reporting uh, you know, young, relatively privileged kids breaking windows, much more so than the kinds of things that we were doing. As a result of the days of rage, dozens of protesters faced charges ranging from disorderly conduct to felony mob action. Many never appeared for court dates. I don't think that the days of rage was a particularly smart or um, effective tactic. I think it was a very difficult time to know what to do. 
but we were determined to see through our strategy of, of uh, militant opposition and trying to mobilize all of the militants to come to Chicago to display their anger, their outrage, um, and their deep opposition to this war. Now, it was a colossal failure in the sense that we didn't mobilize lots of people to come. We were making decisions in the middle of things, and anyone who thinks they knew what should have been done in 1969 is probably kidding themselves. And to those people, I'd like to say, what should we do now? Ten months later, Brian Flanagan was acquitted on aggravated assault charges in connection with Richard Elrod's injury. I was upset at the verdict because I knew Brian Flanagan was a participant in the Weatherman. And when he was found not guilty, as a matter of fact, uh, he got up uh, and gave the salute and said, uh, I'm sorry, I just have one neck to break for my country. Elrod was elected Cook County Sheriff the following year and held that post for 16 years. He is still partially paralyzed. If you're asking me, do I have a, a, a bitter attitude towards uh, life or towards the weatherman or towards Brian Flanagan, uh, and do I go through life uh, holding this as a grudge? No, you can't do that. And, and you forget what happened uh, 35 years ago. In fact, six af months afterwards, you, you just say, life goes on, and, and life does go on. I think that Elrod being hurt in the streets of Chicago was a really um, terrible and, and tragic uh, outcome of that particular demonstration. Five months after the days of rage, the Weathermen went into hiding after three of their leaders were killed in New York City when a bomb they were making accidentally exploded. By 1970, Students for a Democratic Society was gone, and many members blamed the Weathermen for its demise. But even some who disagreed with the Weathermen defend them today. It's easy to money morning quarterback, but we shouldn't be too harsh on ourselves. When all is said and done, the Weather Underground, our grouping, all of it, we were all on the right side of history, as opposed to the Kissingers and the people who have a blood of a million Vietnamese on their hands.